Um, thank you for showing up today. I appreciate it. My name is Aaron Salato. I am a program manager at Microsoft. Now, before I was a program manager, I was a consultant. I was data platform MVP. I am a program manager for SQL experiences, which means tools, which means SSMS and Azure Data Studio, not Query Store. So when I'm talking today, I'm talking because I love Query Store. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and this is something that I talked about for about six years before I joined Microsoft. So passions don't die, right? And I am here to talk to you about this feature because I love it. I'm not talking to you as the PM of the feature from Microsoft. Uh, so I like to make that clear. Secondly, really quick, I want to make a mention that uh, I've been speaking for a long time. I've been doing training, et cetera. Some of you may have known that. Um, and for those of you who are interested in speaking, particularly those of you who are women, for those of you who are non-binary, who want to get into speaking, if that's something you want to talk to me about, please come find me afterwards. And those of you also whose questions don't get answered within today, please come find me afterwards, OK? This is the abstract. I assume that you have all read it. I'm not going to read it to you again. This is just to make sure that you're in the right place. So if you didn't want to learn about best practices for Query Store, now is your time to go. And it won't offend me if you get up and walk out of the room because I have teenagers, and they do that to me all the time. So it's not a problem. So when we talk about best practice, I kind of like to lay a little groundwork here to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what I want to talk about today. So this is some definition. I think I pulled it from the internet, right? Which is uh, basically, we want to make sure that we're getting optimal results uh, and is established as um, for widespread adoption. Now, I don't know if what I'm going to tell you truly has widespread adoption, but that's why I'm here, because I think that it needs to. Right? I think that these are really important things that folks need to understand if you are using Query Store. Show of hands, how many of you have Query Store enabled in a production environment right now? OK. Those of you who do not, does anybody want to tell me why? You haven't upgraded yet. So you haven't upgraded to SQL Server 2016 or higher. Oh, my friend, my friend, OK. Uh, anyone else? Yes. Some of the code and query store don't interact well. Do you have an ad hoc workload? Oh, we're going to talk. Some of it's ad hoc, not parameterized. Dynamic, at, yes, okay, we'll talk. Uh, we'll get to that. Anyone else? Yes? Your DBA would not allow you to. Is your DBA here? <laughs> you hope not. Okay. Uh, if your DBA is here, I'd be happy to talk to them. Uh, and and uh, this session is being recorded, right, and will be available later. So uh, you can happily share that. I have been. Uh, enabling Query Store in environment since its release in 2016, right? And the things that matter when we are talking about best practices and making sure that Query Store runs well are your version, your workload, and its configuration. And that includes trace flag. I already have a question about trace flags. I'm going to get to that, so it's a great question because it's going to get answered. The number one thing I get asked every time I present on Query Store is what is the performance overhead? What do you think the answer to that question is? Depends. Perfect. It depends. That is the answer. We'll talk about what it depends on right here. So a few basics to level set. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Query Store is enabled at the database level, right? This isn't server level. This is database level. It is the data for Query Store persisted in tables internal to the database. So system tables, primary file group. You cannot enable it for master model tempdb. Model has an asterisk because if you enabled it for model, right, then it would be enabled for all new databases you created, which is now the default in 2022. You have to have view database state to look at that data. You have to be DB owner to force and unforce with great power 
comes great responsibility. And until SQL 2022, if you had a availability group, an availability group, no data would be captured on the readable secondaries. That's all we're covering in terms of basics. Other than, it's important to understand a little bit about the internals and what's happening behind the scenes for Query Store. So here's my database on the right, and I have my internal tables here within that that are holding that Query Store data. I, when I talk about Query Store, I tend to break out the data in terms of how I talk about it into plan store, into runtime stats, and into wait stats. So that's kind of how I tend to, to push out the data. When we get to 2022, we actually kind of have another chunk of data. But all of this, in addition to living in these internal tables, there is also memory that is holding this information. So there are memory buffers. This is not in-memory OLTP, right? These are memory buffers that are holding query stored data. And so when we initiate a query, right, it goes through compilation optimization and then it gets executed. Along that process, once compila compilation occurs, we get information that gets pushed over into those in-memory buffers immediately. And then once, uh, at some point, that will get flushed out to the tables. Once execution completes, finishes, then we're getting information over to runtime stats and wait stats, again, still sitting in memory. And then eventually, that gets pushed out to those internal tables. This pushing out is asynchronous, right? There's a setting that actually controls this. By default, it's gonna happen every 15 minutes. So this is important when we go to talk about uh, why the version is important, but I need, you to make, I need to make sure that everyone understands this, that we have these in-memory buffers that are holding information, and then data gets asynchronously flushed out to the database. So why does version matter? There have been several performance optimizations within different releases of SQL Server. So those are related to internal memory limits, and I'm gonna go into detail for, for all of these. Transactions for background flushes of data and the cleanup mechanism. Depending on what version you're on right now, if you're not on the latest and greatest, you could potentially run into an issue with one of these. So in terms of memory use, right? There is a ha there's a few different memory clerks that are used for query store. One of them holds a hash mat hash map, not hash match, not talking about plans, hash map, which has a unique key for every single query that is executed. Your workloads, which are more ad hoc, are going to have a larger memory hash because, hash map, because those are queries are more unique. So you all remember how in the plan cache, we have textual matching, right? When I execute a query, select star from table, join to another table where last name equals Stellato. And then I run that same query, joining two tables together, where last name equals Jones. Those are two different queries within the plan cache, and those are two different queries within query store, which means in this hash map, there are two different queries. So those of you that have parameterized procedural type of workloads, right, your hash map is a little bit smaller. Those of you that use Entity Framework and Hibernate Link to SQL, where you have all kinds of ad hoc, yours is gonna be larger, which means more memory. So the query text might be different slightly, but the query hash, the query fingerprint, can be the same. The query plan hash can be the same. And then our runtime statistics are stored in a separate hash, mash, hash map, right? So multiple memory clerks in play here related to query store. Now, why do we care about this? Because until a certain release, there was no memory limit imposed on that space. Does anybody here have a query store? Those of you that are running it. Does anybody here have a query store that is larger than 10 gigs? That's excellent. 
I worked with a customer that once had a query store where they set it to 100 gigs. And the challenge is that a majority of that information actually has to be in memory. So the larger your query store, the more information that has to be held in memory. Now, not all of it, but this, the hash map that gets created for the queries is really important. So eventually, a limit was added because this was problematic where query store will manage that better than it used to. And if it's using too much memory, it will push the database into a read-only state until it can address that memory and then put it back into a read-write state. So this is a proactive step that's being taken. So what we're talking about here is this memory space, these buffers on your server. Right? So we now have a limit as to what space that can consume. And that was introduced in these different releases in cumulative updates. So that's there in Azure SQL. And then depending on what version of SQL Server you are running on-prem or in a VM in Azure, you need to make sure that you're on those CUs or higher. Now, in general, I would say I'd want you on the latest CU. Okay? But th that is when this fix was introduced. Another change, right? There, what I talked about data being asynchronously flushed from those in-memory buffers out to disk. This is a background activity, and there were times with a really high volume, high throughput uh, workload, this would take a very long time. There were, there were large transactions, and this was very problematic. So from this space, we're talking about this async write that's occurring from those memory buffers out to disk. That could cause severe problems, could cause um, not only going, it would stay in a read-write state, but the system uh, would go into a, a not very good stable state at all. Um, so this was modified as well in a certain set of CUs, earlier CUs actually than the memory one. Again, I would prefer you're on latest and greatest, but this is when that fix was introduced. And then the last one were, was changes to the cleanup mechanism. So one of the great things about Query Store is that when you exceed 90% of the max size that you have set, the cleanup will automatically kick in. Um, and there's also um, time-based cleanup that occurs based on how many days of data that you're collecting. The challenge is that um, cleanup particularly size-based cleanup, is woefully inefficient, and it is single-threaded. You're like, yeah, I've seen that, right? So there had to be some changes introduced here as well to improve that process. In general, I'm just going to tell you this in general, you do not want size-based cleanup to kick in if you can help it, which means that when you configure query store, you're setting a size, and then you need to be monitoring that size, and if you're getting close to it, you have to make a decision. Do I need to keep less data, keep fewer days of data, or uh, should I increase the size of query store? So in this case, we're talking about how much space have I allocated to query store anyway, and when is that data going to be purged? How much of it do I need to keep? Uh, when do I want it to be removed? This was added um, in a different set of CUs as well. So the thing is, a lot of this was introduced in 2019 and then pulled back to 2017, 2016, but you need to make sure that you're on the latest and greatest CUs to pick up those changes. I'm going to pause right here, see if we have any questions. Great. In a worst case scenario, I'm just going to interject this, you do have the ability to turn Query Store off, and uh, until these CUs listed at the bottom, uh, you couldn't do that, which meant uh, I would see scenarios where query store and the server was in kind of a bad state, like it had exceeded the max number of size, maybe there was an open transaction and that it was trying to write, and then people would try to reboot, and then when the reboot occurred, um, there may be a potential issue with loading that data if they didn't have the trace flag enabled, and so trying to turn query store off was blocked by the flushing that was occurred. So if you alter database, set query store off with forced, it is like an immediate shutdown. 
anything that's in memory is not going to be written out to query store, right? You're going to lose that information, but you can turn it off quickly if needed. Now, ideally, we never get to this state, right? Ideally, you're on the latest CU for your release that has these improvements that I've mentioned, and you don't have to do this. But that's not the only thing you need to do. You also need to think about your workload. And this workload discussion is really independent of, um, independent of Query Store. Query Store can just make it appear uh, like there's a problem. So I've mentioned ad hoc and, and parameter, parameterized already, but I want to make sure that we're clear on definitions, right? So in a procedure, procedural workload or parameterized workload, the statements are the same because the text does not change because we have input parameters um, or we've got declared variables in there. So this is great in terms of cache reuse. You've seen this already, right? Those of you that, that have um, been in this world for a while, you know about the potential problems with procedures, but right, plan cache use is great, which means also that query store use is great in that those individual queries, right? We only have one entry for the query because it's parameterized. So as an example, right? On the left, uh, we're declaring color name, we're setting it to blue, and then our query is below, which is using the at color name variable, right? Any variation of that, that bottom query out the, over there on the left, it's the same. In cache, in query store. Same thing on the right, right? Customer ID is parameterized. And that query, whether I run it one time or a hundred million times, there's one entry for it in the plan cache, there's one entry for it in query store. Contrasted with your ad hoc workload, right? The text changes, and the text usually changes in the form of the input value, right? The input value isn't parameterized. So we get literal values, we have textual matching that occurs in the optimizer, so we get plan cache bloat, and we get query store bloat. That's just what it is, right? A query that runs basically one time and gets one plan, and that's it. It just sits there in cache, right, until it ages out. It sits there in query store until it ages out, however many days later. So sample ad hoc query, right? On the left, where color name equals blue, or yellow, or red, or green, or fuchsia, or purple, or whatever. Right, customer ID can be a million different things here. If you have anything that uses a GUID, that's the one that I've seen the most, right? Where something equals and it's a GUID, and that thing gets run over and over and over again, and it's not simple enough that it's a simple parameterized query, it's complex enough that it looks like a new query every time it runs. Independent of query store, those of you that have ad hoc workloads like this, you have some challenges already, right? Yes, right? Some head nods are good here. Yes, you're aware of those challenges. You have higher CPU, you have plan cache bloat. And in terms of the plan cache, right? Finite amount of space is allocated for that. We know the problems that exist here. DM exec cache plans and the memory limits, this is really what I want to get to, right? This is by default what you have available for plan cache memory depending upon server memory. Those of you with more, you can keep doing the math. But in query store, right, you can set the size of query store to anything uh, as long as you're not in Azure. Azure has a limit of 10 gigs, which is a good, uh, which is a good recommendation, right? If we limit your max, query, your max query store size in Azure to 10 gigs, that's kind of a suggestion that you should limit it to something similar everywhere else. So within query store, right? Queries are uniquely identified based on the text, along with all of these things. Context settings, the object ID, which if, it doesn't, if it's not part of a, a procedure or anything, it's going to be zero. Right, the type of parameterization and the batch SQL handle. Those five things together generate a unique key that goes into that hash map for every single query that executes. So in your ad hoc environment with all these different query texts, you're gonna have all these different unique keys. 
That's your problem. Yes. Do do any settings for query store? No. Ah, if I change um, a context setting. Yes, it is, yes, so if I change a context setting, ANSI nulls, right, any of those settings, if I change that, I have just changed the context settings, which is why, as a side note, sometimes when the users are like, this query is running horribly from my application, and you're like, hold on, and you open up your favorite tool, SSMS or Azure Data Studio, and you run it from there, and you're like, works good for me, right? What's the difference between the two? It can absolutely be context settings. So that's tracked in Query Store, which is great, because it gets easier to find that problem when it occurs, but it also means that when your users are running the query from the app with one set of context settings, and you're running it from your tool with a different set of context settings, that is two different queries within Query Store. So our space is based on max storage size. Uh, the default is one gig now, but I typically see folks set it higher, and I would set it higher, right? I tend to start at about two or four gigs and then monitor it and see if I need it to go higher, but I don't recommend setting it above 10 gigs. Now, starting in 2019, you have more control over what you, get ca what you can capture using query capture mode. Right, this was introduced in SQL Server 2019. It's also in Azure. But let me talk really quick about what this workload looks like. So over here, can you all see that in the back? Good, thank you for confirming. I have already restored my database. I'm going to turn on Query Store. I'm gonna turn it on as a side note with settings that I do not recommend for production. Do not set interval length minutes to one. Bad idea, just for a demo here. So I'm turning this on, I've cleared out anything that's in Query Store, and then I have two procedures that I'm gonna create. This one is my random selects procedure, and basically I'm getting all of these random things. I am concatenating that into my query, and then I'm doing an exec, which basically behaves like an ad hoc query. So for those of you who are doing dynamic string execution, these are not part of an object. These are ad hoc queries. And I'm doing that twice. So let's create this. Now, in my stored procedure over here, which is SP, stored procedure random selects, I have the exact same thing, but I am setting that as a variable essentially, and executing the query that way. So this is gonna be parameterized. So understand that when I run this procedure, these two queries will execute and they're parameterized. The other one, those are gonna be ad hoc queries when I run them. So there we go on that. Now, let's go ahead and I have some fancy stuff here that you're just gonna have to trust me in terms of what it does because I am just gonna run this. So this is gonna call, it's just gonna run and run and run. This is gonna call that store procedure like 100,000 times. I have 10 different threads that are running and they're each calling it like 10,000 times. And so that's, that's going along. And my CPU is low, my batch request per second flow. Like to generate like a real, a real workload on this laptop became really hard. So we're just gonna let it run, and I'm more concerned about how many times it executes than anything else. If we start to look at what's in Query Store, right here, you can see here, right? We have basically 100,000 executions of this query. If I scroll over here so you can see it, right? it is the parameterized query right here. So I've just gone and run this, I think that's finished, that's done. So at this point in Query Store, I have, let's see for sure, somewhere like 20, 30, maybe 40 unique queries, not even 20, 17 unique queries, 19, uh, 20 different plants. That's it. 
I'm not even, we're going to remember that. I can remember that, right? Let's look at memory use. Memory use, we have a total of like five gigs being used. No problem. Now let's clear that out. So we're going to just, don't do this in production either, right? Only good for demos. We're going to clear out query store again. Now I'm going to run this uh, ad hoc one. So this is going to call that ad hoc procedure, but it's going to do that just with two threads. Because this runs a lot slower. Because every time I'm executing a query, it has to go through compilation and optimization, right? So it doesn't happen as fast. I'm still really not pushing this machine in any way, shape, or form. Uh, if I wanted to, I have to run about 20 threads, and then it really takes like 10 minutes for all of that to run, which we don't want to just watch this run for 10 minutes. That's not very exciting. But we've run two threads, and even though they haven't finished, look what we have at this point in Query Store. First of all, that other time I ran the query, it returned really quickly. You'll notice right here that this is going to sit here and it's going to run for a little bit. And I'm going to let it go, and if I scroll over, right, it's running all of these queries with all of these different values, right? different customer IDs, different customer IDs, right? Different strings. Every one of those goes into Query Store. And I'm not gonna, I don't wanna wait for that to finish because I'm impatient, but let's see where we are right now with our counts, right? We're at 20 some thousand, right? And I'm only running two threads. So this problem, this workload challenge is really independent of Query Store. It just becomes really easy to see in Query Store. You can actually see it in the plan cache. But here, it starts to get even worse, right? So we were at three megs of memory used. We're, only, we're at over 100 at this point, which I know 100 doesn't sound like a lot, but if we're talking three to 100, that's a significant increase just from my workload, yes. Does the uh, instance level option of optimize for ad hoc workloads, where is it? Here it is. Does that matter? Now I have it set to false because it's the default. It affects the plan cache, right? Because the first time the query executes, it just puts the stub for the cache in memory. So that's fine for the plan cache. But what happens in Query Store? What happens in Query Store? Th you, you know the answer. What is it? I think it gets cached in five gets recorded. It gets the whole plan. Okay. It gets the whole plan. So optimize for ad hoc workloads. If you enable it, which I would recommend enabling if you have an ad hoc workload, for sure, because it's going to help your plan cache, does not affect Query Store. Because Query Store says, I want to capture the query, I want to capture the plan. Oh, this is your plan? I can't put the plan stub in. I have to put the plan in. So, it doesn't matter. Yes. Yes. How does query store treat the procedure if an underlying object is dropped or recreated? Will they create a new cache? What if it uses select star and then new columns added? Okay, so the question is, what if I have an existing procedure and something that underlies that procedure, something that it references, is dropped? Yes. Okay. Anytime, huh, where am I? Oh gosh. Anytime I change an object in Query Store, how I change it is really important. How, excuse me, let me rephrase that. How I change an object in SQL is really important. If I alter, my object ID stays the same. If I make a change by doing a drop and create, to you and me, we're like, I just dropped it and created it. I maybe only added a column or I changed something, I changed a name, right? But that changes the object ID. And do you remember I had the slide that told you there were five things that were used to create the hash? And one of them was object ID. So when I change, the object ID, then all that information still lives in Query Store, but it's no longer associated with that object ID 
because that doesn't exist in my system table anymore. Poof, that's right. So if you are using query store and you're changing your objects, you need to be using alter instead of drop and create. If I change the text of the query, which was the second part of that question, if I change the text of a query in a procedure, then I have a whole new query. It's a different query text. Remember, there's literal, there's textual matching. It's a whole new query. Uh -huh. Oh, so if it's select star and an extra column is added to the table, right, the query itself stays the same. It's still a select star. So the plan is gonna, the plan may change. I've actually never tested that exactly. There's a lot of it depends there's. That, oh, that was poor grammar, I'm so sorry. Uh, there's a lot of it depends in that question, to answer that question. But the select star, the query itself is not changing text, so it will stay the same. But the plan could change, okay? I'm gonna come back to that. I'm gonna come back to your question. Hang on, let me finish this thought, okay? So we can see, so I think that, that my ad hoc's finished, that was great, and let me just run this query one more time. Um, so we had every, so you saw that we were at uh, over 100, and then it flushed out to disk, right? It did an asynchronous flush while I was chatting, and now we're down to 46. But on a high volume system, we're not gonna have queries that stop executing, right? So that memory is going to continue to increase. Now how do we address that? Fundamentally, I want you to address your workload, right? And what that means is I would love for those of you that have ad hoc workloads to go in and look to find what queries are executed most frequently with the same query hash. It's likely that you have a top 10, a top five, that get executed way more than a lot of others. And I've seen this. I had a customer, with the, the one with the 100 gig uh, query store, they had 600,000, and they were only keeping three days of data. Three days of data. They had 600,000 queries with the same query hash. They parameterized that, they parameterized that one statement, right, and the size of their query store, once we clean that up, dropped significantly. So I have a hunch that if you go in and you find your top five or your top 10, and you can parameterize those, you will improve workload performance overall, independent of query store. And on SQL Server 2016 and 2017, if you have that high of a, if you have that ad hoc of a workload, you may not be able to use query store, even if you're on the latest CU for 2016 and 2017. Because until 2019, you can't customize your configuration enough. Let me show you what that looks like. So 2019 options are right here. We have this, I'll even go to red here. We have custom capture mode right here, and then you set the capture policy. How many times does the query have to execute? What is the total compile CPU time? What is the total execution CPU time? You set those thresholds. Previously, all you had was all, which meant capture every query, which you do not want to have set, or you had auto, which meant that the engine determined what was captured based on internal thresholds, which are not documented and are, are, are not known. They are known, but most people don't know what they are. Here, you're in control. You set this, but you have to be on 2019 and higher. Now, you're gonna say, how do I know what my compile and my execution time should be? Well, if you enabled query store, even for just a tiny bit, okay, you can get that information. So we can look in here and see what the average compile duration is and look to see how many queries do that, right? So I can see that I've got 13, 14,000 queries that have an average compile duration of, that's five milliseconds. I can set my threshold above that. I can do the same thing for the CPU time. And so what happens then, if I clear all of this out, and let's go ahead and one more time, let's run my ad hoc workload here. Before we had 20 some thousand 
right, at least, and then, and then more. We didn't come back and check it. Different unique queries that went in there. But this is now running. And if I come in and look at Query Store at this point, I'm at 21 rows, right, if I keep running this. So we're getting a few of our queries in, a few of our ad hoc queries are coming in, but the majority of them are not even making it into Query Store because they're only executing one time or because the total CPU or total execution time are below what we set for the thresholds. So number one for your ad hoc workload is can you do some parameterization for some of your queries? Number two, you're gonna have to use the custom capture mode in order to make, in order to use Query Store. So this, the configuration here, a couple notes, and then, and then I'm gonna come back to talking about custom, right? Query store is not enabled in 2016, 2017, 2019 by default for a new database that you create. If you upgrade to SQL 2022, we're not gonna turn query store on for you automatically. But if you create a new database in 2022, query store will be enabled by default. Uh, it's also enabled by default for Azure SQL database and for managed instance. There's nine settings or so related to Query Store. There's a blog post I have that talks about what the defaults are and what I recommend that still holds. What I wanna talk about is this capture mode. So I mentioned, right, the default 2016, 2017 was all. Do not use all. I use it for demos, that's it, not for production, right? Auto is what is recommended until you're on an ad hoc workload and then I would recommend custom. Note that Query Store still has to track in that hash map what queries have executed that are insignificant. So you still have memory use because it's still paying attention to all those unique queries that are being generated. It's, not, it's just not pushing them into Query Store. So custom allows you to determine, to control, to manage what is going into your Query Store in terms of those user queries that are executing. You also have an interval that you can set, which means how many times does it execute across that interval? Uh, the range is like an hour to seven days. Uh, I typically go more on the low side, but it's one of those things where you may tweak, figure out right, what works best in your environment. Trace flags to this question. So the default configuration, 2016, 2017. <clears throat> You start up SQL Server, it's gonna load information from Query Store into memory. While it's doing that, default behavior in 2016, 2017, while it's doing that, you actually can't execute queries against Query Store because it doesn't have everything loaded and so it couldn't capture them into Query Store. Not ideal, right? If you see QDS load DB wait time, that's what's happening in the background. Trace flag 7752 means load the query store data, but let me execute queries against my database. That is default behavior in 2019 and higher. So 2019 and higher, you do not need 7752. 2016, 2017, absolutely recommend using it. Trace flag 7745. This means that when you go to, by default, sorry, default behavior, not with the trace flag applied. Default behavior is when you go to shut down, when you go to fail over, anything that's sitting in those in-memory buffers is gonna be flushed to disk. You likely probably want that to happen, but if there is a failure for some reason or you're trying to fail over quickly, you may not want that behavior, in which case, you put in 7745, and when you go to failover or shutdown, it bypasses writing that information out to Query Store. So do you still need it? It's up to you, right? Is fast failover important? If so, then you may want to enable that, okay? But it is not default behavior at this point. Now, every time I've talked about Query Store, I'm always like, we're not done. And new functionality is going to continue to build on Query Store. And that is absolutely what has happened with IQP features. Now, there's a lot of IQP features. Not all of them use Query Store. So I put together a little table, because this is the way that my brain works, to understand where it fits in, where Query Store fits in. I'm not talking about every one of those. Bob has a wheel of power 
session, right, that he was talking about earlier, go to that if you want to talk about some of these in more detail. But none of these listed here use Query Store. None of these listed here use Query Store. These are the ones. Okay, that was weird to hear my echo back. These use Query Store. So DOP feedback, optimized plan forcing, the feedback persistent one, uh, CE feedback, Query Store hints, which technically is not categorized as an IQP feature, but I thought I would throw it up here for you. Uh, PSPO, parameter sensitive plan optimization, does not require Query Store. You don't have to have it turned on. But if you do have it turned on, you potentially could also get a variation of plan cache bloat there. Because if we are keeping multiple plans for a query up to three, and there are potentially then derivatives within that three, and deriv we could potentially have a problem there. I don't have enough data at this point to tell you what this looks like. So all I'm saying at the moment is, if you're using PSPO and you have query store enabled, Pay attention to how your query store size changes after you enable that. So a few objects, because I like the internals, right, to understand. There's uh, four additional columns that were added to the query store plan uh, view, system view. Uh, query store hints is specific to the hints feature, and then plan feedback and query variant are new objects. In total, this isn't a lot right here. So in terms of using IQP features, even if you're using multiple, this is probably not going to radically change the size of your query store. But if you're using PSPO, that could be a factor. Now what about read-only replicas? Right? This is a game changer, one of the most requested features, still in preview at this point has new objects, query store replicas, and forcing locations which are not that large, runtime stats, query store wait stats have an additional column. This in itself doesn't look like a lot. But what does it mean when we have query store on read-only replicas? It means that we can now enable capture of query store data on a replica, on multiple replicas. Where is that data stored? It's stored back in that user database on the primary. So if my query store was sitting at four gigs, let's say that, that I was, I've been running query store in 2019 for like two years, I'm great, like that's kind of where it sits. I upgrade to 2019, I try this out, I start capturing my query store data on my replica. Your workload over on the replica is gonna determine how much more space you need in query store. That's a consideration that you have to think about, right? So I can't tell you, right, it's X or it's Y. I know that we all like the answer. I can't give you the answer because it depends on your workload. What I do know is that a lot of times the queries that folks run on replicas are big reporting queries, often parameterized, right? And they may take a long time to run. So potentially, you're not introducing a lot into your query store, but I don't know. I don't know how frequently you're running queries. I don't know how many replicas you have. Again, you're going to have to monitor query store size before and after you turn it on. So my general recommendations, run the latest build of your release. You heard that loud and clear, right? Uh, and this slide got out of date today yesterday, because we're on CU2 now, I think for 2022. Use the trace flags. You only need 7752 if you're on 2016, 2017. Make sure you have your query store settings configured appropriately. Capture mode and max size are the two most important. And then understand the impact of your ad hoc workloads. And then I don't have a recommendation on here for IQP or for read-only replicas, because that is very environment specific, and that's something that it's like, let me tell you what you need to think about, and then I need you to pay attention to that, because I don't have a magic answer, a, a one-size-fits-all answer at this point. 
if you enable query store and you find that performance kind of starts to drop, right, make sure first you're on the latest version, check your query store configuration, and then let's take a look at that workload in a little bit more detail. I'm hoping that before you even do that, right, you've looked at these things. Independent of query store, you can have performance issues based on your workload because of, because of it being ad hoc, because of how it is designed entirely. In 2016 and higher, I think it gets really easier, it gets, it gets easier to find these problems using query store, but <clears throat> it means that you have to turn it on. Now you can still find your issues with ad hoc workloads in the plan cache, but it gets a lot easier to find them in query store because of all of the history that it retains. I had left plenty of time for questions, although I could set you free, but what questions do you have at this point? Those of you who haven't turned it on, do you now know what you need to do? Yeah, all right, what, are, what questions do we have? Let me restate this to make sure that I understand your question. You're saying in the case where we have an availability group and we have query store enabled, not just on the primary, but also on one or more read-only replicas, do I need to worry about the primary? Well, primary still remains the concern because when you have query store enabled on the read-only replica, that database is still read-only. It's always read-only. What we do is we take the information from the replica, the query store information, which has its own set of memory buffers over on the replica, we send it over to the primary. It gets written to the primary, because this is a read-only database, right? It has to come over to the primary and get written to the primary, and then because it's an availability group, it gets written to the system tables, right, flush to the transaction log, comes back over here and gets written and hardened to disk over here on the replica, and you can see it over on the replica. So the primary is absolutely always in play and important, right? No data, when you have a query store enabled on a read-only replica, no data is written to a database on the replica because it's read-only. It always comes back to the primary and writes there. Um, haha. Unrelated, but are there any plans to include query store in Azure Data Studio? So I mentioned that uh, I'm on the tools team, right? And uh, I'm, the, I'm the PM for Management Studio and for Azure Data Studio. So if you want to talk about those, I'm also happy to talk about those. Uh, out of curiosity, how many folks in here use Azure Data Studio? Okay. How many folks would use Azure Data Studio if it had query store in it? Uh, it doesn't change it that much. Interesting. Um, independent of that, uh, we are planning to add it to Azure Data Studio. Uh, not just because I'm the PM and I love Query Store, uh, but because uh, folks that are using Azure Data Studio who may be new to Azure SQL, who may not be new to Azure SQL or SQL Server in general, um, Query Store is fundamental for troubleshooting, right, performance problems. So we need to have it in there. Any other questions? Yes. Ooh. <laughs> uh, for standard edition, can I cheat by setting max server memory higher than the amount of memory that's allowed for standard edition, higher than 128? Um, you can do that, it's not gonna matter. So no, no, no. No, I mean, you can set it to whatever you want, right? But it's standard edition, so it's, it's set internally, right? It doesn't matter. So it, that, that isn't going to allow you to circumvent the algorithm that the engine uses internally to, to manage the memory for query store. <laughs>
for some things that do not need the buffer cache, you can do that. Not, not for query, I'm telling you, not for query store. Okay, not for query store. Yep, yep. All right, I am out of time and out of respect for who's ever coming in next, I wanna finish up.